Hello, good evening and welcome. This is the Halliwell Jones Stadium, Warrington. It's England taking on New Zealand in the very first physical disability rugby league World Cup final. And I tell you what, we have a great matchup in front of us. Hello and welcome to the Convex Conversation with me, broadcaster Helen Fospero. The inaugural Physical Disability Rugby League World Cup, known as the PDRL, has just taken place at Warrington Wolves' Halliwell Jones Stadium, made up of squads from Australia, England, New Zealand and Wales. England Community Lions, featuring Leeds Rhino and Convex Claims Adjuster Sam Zeller, proved victorious, beating New Zealand 42-10 to to become world champions after wins against other competing nations. And their victory was in no small part thanks to 23-year-old Sam, who scored a try in the first half, helping the Lions to a 16-4 half-time lead and another try in the second half. Barnett scheming, finds Zeller, Zeller can shift. Gets it out to Parkinson, he definitely can move, he's got so much pace, he slipped the tackle, just falls, but finds Zeller, lovely support we from Zeller. Zeller's got Zeller's pace, got pace. He's, got pace. he's away, he's away, he's there going he under goes. the post. Fantastic work from Zeller, supporting the movement there. That is definitely a beer for Callum Parkinson. Sam was born without a right hand, but it hasn't stopped him living life to the full. I'm delighted to say that fresh from his World Cup winning performance, he's this week's Convex Conversation guest. Sam, have you come back down to earth yet? Yeah, I think so. It was quite surreal this couple of days after after winning. We spoke together, all of the boys, and none of us really realised what we'd done and it hadn't really sunk in. It really took a couple of days to realise we'd won and it was probably about a a week high, like waking up going, yeah, we've won a World Cup here. And looking at the medals. And the final whistle sounds. Can I say it? Can I say it? Go on. England are PDRL World Champions. Absolutely fantastic performance from England. Now you've had a chance to reflect a little bit. What does it feel like making history in the PDRL? Yeah, it's quite emotional, I think, with the sort of journey all of the players have been on individually and together and that almost etched into history that we not only participated in the World Cup but were the first ever winners is like a real special thing for everyone involved, I think. Can you give us a little sense of the journey that some of your teammates have been on? What kind of disabilities have they overcome to be playing at this World Cup PDR level? There's really a split in our team between the people who are born with disabilities and the people who something's happened to them in in their lives and they've gained a disability. So a lot of the players in our team have cerebral palsy, which is something you're born with, or are people like me who were born without limbs. And then other members of the team who are maybe amputees who have had accidents, or there's a couple of boys who have had operations which have led to them having like brain injuries and things like that. So there's a real split. And I think the split makes the squad so special because no one has the same experiences. For me, for example, I've not been through a traumatic incident that's led me to gain a disability. I've always been like this. Whereas the people who have maybe been through these accidents will say to me, well, I've realized what it's like to be normal. I have had that experience. And that's where we almost like came to common ground, be like, we've had different paths, but we are in essentially the same team in the same scenario now. Team sports, there's always a sense of camaraderie, but I would imagine there's perhaps an even deeper one with all of you having those shared experiences and being able to talk to each other very openly and honestly about what things you've gone through in your life. Yeah, I think that's why being in camp was really important to the whole team and for us to come together. A lot of the conversations were had over dinner quite organically and there's a lack of people weren't worried about saying the wrong thing because we've all got these disabilities. So someone would walk in and I'd be like, what happened to you? Or not in these many words, but what's wrong with you? Why are you here? And it it was quite nice to just sit and just talk about it over dinner. And some people have some amazing stories of why they've ended up in the position they are. And from an outsider's perspective and myself, I look at some of the players and just think some of the things you've overcome in your life is unbelievable. And then you've decided to step back out onto the rugby pitch. And then you've gone on to represent England. It's almost ridiculous some of the stuff these guys do. And I suppose in a way a little bit different from you because 
although you're missing your right hand, you were born like that. So I suppose, Sam, you've never known anything different. And I'm not suggesting that makes it any easier. But as you said, you've not gone through something traumatic. You've lived without your right hand since you were born, haven't you? Yeah, exactly. And I think that's what makes the team so special and so different that there's a mixture. Some of the guys didn't want to share about what the experiences they've been through. And that's absolutely fine. I think if you take a step back, we were there at that point in time. And you don't need to look back and say why I'm here. But yeah, I mean, growing up with it obviously makes it a lot easier. I did almost all the adapting when I was really young. And for me now, it's essentially just normal. It's how how I operate. Whereas some of the other guys will have had like these experiences and some of them like relatively recently. Connor Lyons had a stroke, I think four weeks before, uh, four months, sorry, before the World Cup. And he essentially was told he wasn't going to be able to run, never mind play rugby for the World Cup. And I mean, he scored two against Wales. That's absolutely extraordinary, isn't it? There are some great photographs of you. One of my favourite ones is the one where you lifted the cup. Take me back to that moment, Sam. How did that feel? It's one of those things that I I almost struggled to put into words. There was a a lot of people stayed behind to celebrate us at the Halliwell Jones after the game and just being walked over, just looking for my parents really to go and say thank you to them, sort of everything they've done for me, like letting me play rugby essentially. I'm sure it was quite hard for my mum when I was a kid to look at me and go, he's got this disability, do I really want him playing rugby where he could get hurt again? But yeah, I really struggled to put it into words. So for your mum and dad, they must have felt such an enormous sense of pride. Yeah, I didn't really get to see them after the game. They jetted off on holiday, but I got a message from them the next day saying like, unbelievable what you've done. So proud and like, that was that was sort of all I needed to hear. I almost wasn't bothered about messages from friends and, and stuff like that. I was just quite happy to get that message from my parents saying, we sort of realised what you've done here. And you played rugby, well, rugby union, actually, since you were a little boy, haven't you? Yeah, I played for Ketchum Rugby Club. I think I started when I was five or six, sort of playing tag rugby and played all the way up through age groups into adult rugby until I eventually left for university and did a bit of representative stuff. But it's essentially like, I don't want to call it my life, but it's a massive part of my life playing the sport. And I can imagine, as a mum myself, when you were that little boy, feeling probably very protective of you, it must have been a big thing, perhaps particularly for mum, to see you doing such a physical sport from such a young age. Yeah, to be honest, I don't think she was massively happy about it. (laughs) I had conversations with her, maybe, I think it was last year at Christmas, and she said, look, when I was first born, she was really protective, not just in a sporting sense. Obviously, having a baby with one hand, people would stare at me quite a lot. And she essentially reached the point where she was like, look, I'm not going to be able to bubble wrap you your entire life. People aren't going to change. So you've almost got to get on with it. And she sort of, I think in her words, she sort of set me free and just went, do what you want to do and we'll see what happens, which was quite nice. A little bit irresponsible, maybe, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> she sounds a very special lady. Just before we move on to the actual game itself, what did doctors think happened? Was there something that happened in the womb, do you think, as to why that right hand didn't develop? I think, so I've been told, it was either the umbilical cord being wrapped around my wrist. So it was also wrapped around my neck. So apparently I was quite a wiggly child and had managed to tie myself up in knots. But it, it was either that, which I think they said it's would have stopped the blood flow and, and essentially just stopped the growth of my hand. Or there's a theory that my hand went through an amniotic band in the womb, which again, just essentially constricted my hand and stopped the blood flow and stopped it growing into into a normal hand, really. And have you coped okay with that over the years? Have you just learned to adapt really and get on with just the one? Yeah, I think physically there was quite a lot that my parents did to help me along with it. There's a charity called Reach, which I used to go to a lot. And that's where I learned to tie my shoelaces, how I learned to get on with things. And my parents were always really keen for me to use whatever adaptation I needed. I think just due to the nature of me, I don't like relying on adaptation. So I'd normally throw them out and just have a go on my own, which obviously wasn't wasn't what they wanted when they were paying money for these adaptations but it's one of those things that what are you going to do you're not going to not do things because of it so you're just going to have to find a way around it or ask for help which is definitely a last resort for me. I can tell that from your competitive nature already. For rugby league fans give us a flavour of the the winning game itself and how it went. 
so it was New Zealand. We thought it was going to be a bit of an easy game. So we'd played them previously on the Friday and they weren't the, the team we'd seen previously. I think they'd rested quite a lot of players. So coming into the final, we were relatively confident, but New Zealand came out really firing. They're a really physical team. In the first half, I think we scored one or two in the first half and they scored one. We all went into the changing rooms almost a little bit worried. Well, I, don't, I can't speak for the other boys, but for me, I was like, we're not letting this slip. The amount of work we've all put in across this, not just the 10 days, but we've been training for best part of like a year and a half, two years. And I think that was a combination of New Zealand being really good, but also nerves. It was a World Cup final. Worry if you weren't nervous about playing. But the second half went out and... I think after people calmed down, we, we were able to play the rugby we wanted to. And there was a lot less drop balls and we played around them. And I think that was probably a combination of us calming down, but also our fitness. Something that we'd really worked on to be able to go the full length. Here comes Zeller through the middle. Oh, he's best the backfield. And away he goes. All right, then, got me. Has anybody got the pace to catch him up? I don't think they have. Zeller with a spectacular effort. He's now weaving in and out. He'll go to the post. Great score. What a start to the second half from Sam Zeller. Credit to New Zealand. They properly gave us a physical game. The next morning, there were people like limping around the hotel, left, right and centre. <laughs> oh, it was, they gave yeah, you a run for your money. Yeah, they really did. And you were coached by former England men's international fullback, Sean Briscoe. What's Sean been like to work with? I didn't really know what to expect from Sean. Obviously, I'd met him briefly a couple of times when Leeds were playing Warrington, but I didn't know what to expect in camp. And he's genuinely a lovely guy who loves the sport. And just to put it out there, I can't thank him enough. What he's done for not just the England team, but PDRL in general, it's all, all volunteer work. Like he's had his day. He's got caps for England. He didn't need to do any of this and he's taken time out of his life to coach and help develop this sport for not only the current players but the future players he was an unbelievable coach and it was quite nice to see him say here are the tools this is what we want to do what we want to play go do it there wasn't much micromanaging I think he quite obviously had a lot of faith in us and said you've been picked for England because we think you're the best we've seen what you can do here are the tools go and play go and win and he was relatively hands-off in the games what would you say were the biggest learnings that you got from him? I think the environment in camp that he created, I, along with essentially everyone else in camp, had never been in that sort of environment before. And he helped us learn the importance of recovery and the importance of knowing each other. So something he made a really big thing about was learning each other's disabilities to be able to play to the strengths of each other which I thought was quite interesting and quite a smart thing to do. For example, a couple of boys, if someone doesn't have a right arm, then we play them on the left so they're able to catch and tackle a lot easier. And if I'm passing to someone that way, then I'd do it a bit more sympathetic. Whereas if there was someone with a left arm, I'd be able to throw it a little bit harder. And I think that came down to almost playing smart, which was definitely something that he put the emphasis on. He was like, why are we going to give ourselves more work if we don't need to sort of thing? Gosh, that's a really clever strategy, isn't it? A lot of people won't know a lot about physical disability rugby league. I know it did start in Australia about 10 years ago, but it's relatively new over here. And of course, you played and won in the first World Cup. Will you just explain a bit about how it differs to the rugby league that we're probably more familiar with? Yeah, of course. So we try to play as close to able-bodied rugby league as you can. So we play with two less players, so it's 11 a side on a full-size pitch, and we have the same tackle count and kick on fifth sort of thing. But because of the variety of disabilities, we play both full and touch. So you can have two players on at one time who wear red shorts, and that essentially means their disability prevents them from being able to do contact. So them being tackled, you just tag them, or them tackling, they tag someone. As well as that, because of the differing disabilities, you'll notice we all wear different coloured socks, and that's because we're banded into three disability classes. So you have A's, which is someone like me, whose disability only affects one limb, B's, which is two, and then C's. And the thinking behind that is you have to have a certain amount of each category on the pitch at one time. So it splits the disabilities up and essentially prevents teams from picking the least disabled people in order to win which 
isn't what the game's about. I know we're discussing winning the World Cup, but if you take a step back, it's not what the game's about. It's about having an inclusive game for everyone to play. And then we have sort of other adaptations. A lot of the people that play have sort of most issues in their hands and arms. So if you drop a ball, it's not a knock-on. It just counts as a tackle which stops the game being slowed down so we don't have scrums, which will slow the game down and gives each team a fairer crack. And you want the team to be balanced, don't you? Which is, I would imagine, where those three categories come in. It wouldn't be a fair game, would it, if they weren't balanced in terms of disability, I suppose? No, exactly. And I think that's the point of the shorts, to essentially balance the teams, but to also give everyone an opportunity. It's not fair on on people playing if people with the most minor disabilities are getting picked just because the nature of their disability for the whole squad. And as I say, it's not what the game's about. The game's about letting anyone with disability who wants to play. And I think the different categories also makes it a bit safer. So you don't have a full team of people with, with who are less disabled playing against a team who have more severe disabilities. So it was established, PDRL was established in Australia 10 years ago. Who founded it and what was the idea behind it? I'm just wondering how it all came about, Sam. It was George Tonner, who we refer to as the grandfather of the sport. The way he describes it is he tried to play able-bodied and was sort of struggling and looked around and thought, there's got to be a way that I can play. And I think he put the feelers out across Australia and discovered there was an appetite for it. And there, there was people who ultimately wanted to play rugby despite whatever circumstances they'd been put in. And yeah, it's been going for, like I said, about 10 years over there. And it was actually brought to the UK by the Warrington Foundation. So I think someone in their foundation essentially saw it and thought, have you seen this? We've got a a men's, a women's and a wheelchair team. Why don't we have a crack at this? And that sort of all spiralled into the first game in, I think, 2017 against Leeds. And you met George Tonner. Yes, yeah. So he was over for the World Cup. He was playing for Australia. So we met a lot of people from the different teams, but it was quite nice to meet him and have a chat. Although I didn't say it at the time, I was looking at him going, we're all here because of you, because you made the decision to start this sport. And he probably won't listen to this, but if he does, just want to say like a thank you. And I don't think anyone who's played in the World Cup or watched it will be able to thank him enough for it. And the tournament was also a great experience for Australian comedian and TV and radio star Adam Hills, who made his International Rugby League debut for Australia. Tell us a bit about Adam and his experience. So Adam is genuinely just a good guy. He's an Australian comedian, obviously born in Australia without a leg. And he was one of the big champions for bringing rugby league over to England. I think the way he describes it, someone tweeted him saying... Have you seen Sydney Rabbitohs won the the physical disability game at the weekend? And he looked into it and was like, wow, well, why on earth don't we have it over here? And I think for him, it was an opportunity to play the sport he loved and that was essentially taken away from him. But he's been a massive champion for the sport, getting it airtime and essentially showing the world what the sport's about. He's become a spokesperson, hasn't he? Yeah, because he's got quite a big public profile I think he's used that to push PDRL at people in a nice way sort of thing which has been unbelievable for the game there's been a documentary which they filmed and that was Warrington going over to Australia to participate in the first world club challenge cup I think they were filming a sort of sequel to that around the world cup while we were there I think everyone who plays understands that a lot of this wouldn't have happened without him driving the game forward and Arguably, the World Cup, I personally think that if he wasn't there driving the sport and trying to push it towards people, that we wouldn't have had a World Cup. Or if we did, it wouldn't have been anywhere near as good as it was. And did you get a chance to talk to Adam Hills at some points? I know Adam relatively well. Obviously, we played against each other for however many years. And he, he's down in London as well, where I am. But I spoke to him and what really got me was I think Australia after their third game. So they hadn't won one yet and he was still smiling. For him, it was about the tournament and about how big the sport is going to get. And that really caught me off guard. But he's genuinely just a good guy. I don't know how else I can say it. And he's done unbelievable amounts for everyone playing the sport. He's an incredible comedian as well. Does he make you laugh when you, you know, some comedians are just funny when they're on stage and not necessarily off stage, but is he quite a funny guy? Can you see that sense of humour coming through? Oh yeah, he's he's, he's full of it. <laughs> Probably not the, not the best use of words, but he, if you watch anyone have a conversation with him, 
both people will be smiling and both people will be laughing the whole time. He just genuinely is a cheery guy. I think he said that, well, he said it was a huge day for Disability Rugby League, but also he'd realised his boyhood dream with all of this. So really, really great that he's championed it and presumably will continue to champion it so that the sport really, really grows. But how did you feel, Sam, when you heard about it and you heard that it was coming over here? Presumably you must have been really excited and looking forward to trying to get involved. I actually heard about it through my dad. So I started playing rugby league at university. And I think in my first year, I got a message from my dad saying that Leeds Rhinos are setting up a physical disability team. Do you want to have a crack at that? And I was sort of like, yeah, it's a long way. Maybe, maybe. I remember watching on YouTube a game from New Zealand. I think it was a New Zealand-Australia game. And it was one of the Australian guys getting clattered by one of the New Zealand forwards. I remember watching it just going, yeah, I fancy a bit of this. This is, <laughs> yeah, this this will be good for me. And I sort of went up, I emailed Chris Godfrey, who was running the Leeds team at the time. And he was like, yeah, come down, went up to training and sort of never, never looked back. And what is your training like to get to this level of fitness to play at, at this kind of standard? A lot of it was for me, and I know for a lot of the other boys, it was individual work that you were doing on your own. So the festival setup, which we have in the domestic league, is quite intense. So you will play three games on a day. Personally, I, I struggle to train. I, obviously, I'm based in, in London. So going up to Leeds on a Monday night is quite a big ask for me. But having spoken to a lot of the boys as well for England, people were training like five, six days a week, trying to get in shape, trying to make sure their fitness was, was up to scratch. And I think that sort of showed how dedicated the whole team were. It wasn't a set plan that we were given. It was, look, we're here. We want to play for England and we're going to do anything we can to win the World Cup, essentially. And does it involve a lot of gym work as well, a lot of hours in the gym to keep strong? Yeah. For me personally, I'm not naturally a big guy. So I spend a lot of time in the gym at lunch times, in between working or after work. I spend a lot of time there just so I can bring a physical aspect to my game, which for anyone that's seen the games, I'm not the most physical player anyway, but imagine what I'd be like if I didn't go to the gym. <laughs> now, you studied geology and physical geography, I think, at university. How did that lead you to become a claims adjuster for Convex? Honestly, I've got no answer for you. When you leave university, I was sort of like, I need a grad scheme. And my parents were very stern in saying, you're not coming to live back at home. Nice. So I was like, <laughs> I need to get a job here. And I was looking around, fired off a lot of applications. And I remember coming across Convex's, hands up, I didn't know it was an insurance firm at the time. And I remember one of the questions was, if you were CEO for a day, what would you do? And I was like, yeah, they actually want to know what I'm about and what I think is important. And I filled that out and then got asked for a first interview and then sort of read up and then was like, oh, it's an insurance firm. I don't know about this because obviously the reputation that insurance has with people having car insurance and stuff. But, but I was like, let's give, give it a crack. A job's a job. And I haven't looked back. I don't think I'd want to be anywhere else in any other industry at this point in time. Can you remember what you said or a bit of what you said when they said, what would you do if you're CEO for the day? I can. So I went down the environmental route. I said that, that I'd make the company paperless, which to be honest, Convex nearly are paperless. And I was like, I'd make us paperless as well as being good for the environment. It's a way to market yourself as, as a new fluid insurance firm. Wow, fantastic. And as we said earlier, before we came on this podcast, I think you've chosen very well. It's an, an amazing company. One thing that's just occurred to me is, have you suffered any injuries when you've been playing rugby? Yes. In my first year of university, when you step up into university, it's quite a big difference between a small 18 year old and essentially playing men. But I dislocated my shoulder. It was my first start for the first team rugby league team against Loughborough. And about 20 minutes in, I dislocated my shoulder. And that was essentially the end of me for about a year and a half doing rehab and gym work and stuff. But yeah, that was pretty painful. You must have been crushed, were you? Absolutely devastated, I would have thought, to be, to be having to be doing rehab for a year and a half and away from the game. Yeah, that's something that like the injury pain goes away, but it was sort of a, a recurring one. But something I didn't realise would hit me as much as it did was not being able to play, not being able to train and not being able to play with essentially my mates. All I did to combat that essentially was go down to training with the university every week and not train, just sit there and chat with 
whoever else was injured, we've always had what we call injury club on the side of the pitch. And that essentially kept me involved with the sport until I got fit to play again. But yeah, it was a very, very long year and a half. Oh, it must have been really hard as well. And I think also just for our, our mental wellness as well, that physicality is so important in life, isn't it? To get out there and run and be outside and play sports. So I can imagine it must have been hugely frustrating. Yeah, massively. And that leads me on really well to what a lot of disabled people miss out on. There's not really that many sports for disabled people. And if there are, a lot of them are individual. And I think being part of a team is something that's so hard to replicate the sort of shared experiences and like you said for your mental health the physical aspect of the game is is unbelievable and if you listen to a couple of interviews that Adam does he really understands that it's something that a lot of people in the community miss out on being able to be part of the team and it's just so important I think. That camaraderie is really really important I think. What now? I mean we've seen those beautiful photographs of you lifting the cup. You are World Cup champions. Where does it go from here? What are your next dreams or aspirations since you're kind of pretty much right up there at the top? Yeah honestly I don't know. From a sports perspective, we as the sort of England team and coaching staff are just trying to get this sport as much exposure as we can. We want to keep the sport in the sort of current limelight that it's in. And I think we're going to essentially try and keep these international games going. Wales have got a, a pretty decent team, so they want to set up some internationals with them. But we're really keen not to let all of the hard work that everyone's done to get this sport into the limelight go to waste and fall away until the next World Cup and then it get put back in the limelight and then fall away again. I think we as a sort of community are are really trying to push this sport and get it out to as many people as possible and essentially to allow people the opportunity to come and play the sport. For me personally, if loads of people join the sport and I'm no longer good enough to play for England, then my job's done. Like more people have found the sport more people have been able to play and be a part of this team if I'm not included in the England squad then so be it but what matters to me is more people being able to play the game and and the youth teams mostly playing rugby in my youth has had such a massive impact on me and essentially the person I am today it's not nice that people miss out on it because of whatever circumstances they've been put in or or born into and I think that's what we're trying to do build the sport from the ground up. I know that the RFL are are trying to create youth teams to essentially feed the domestic league. And that's, for me, the most important thing off the back of this World Cup. What would you say to anybody listening to this who likes the sound of it and would like to get involved? Just Google it. Genuinely, just Google it and there'll be a team somewhere near you and get down. Once you meet the group of people who play the sport, there's absolutely no going back. We quite often say that everyone who plays the sport has a story and once you sort of chat to someone and find out more about them find out their story it really draws you in and obviously people ask about your story and as well as the playing aspect it's quite nice to have friends who have had similar experiences to you because as much as people can sympathize what experiences you've had because of your disability or or which caused your disability people do struggle to relate and I think having that group of friends that won't have had the same experience but will have had similar is so important because you're able to talk about these things and relate to each other like personally I've never been able to relate to people in the same way I can the guys I play rugby with. That's fantastic and will you get chance do you hope to defend your title and when will the next rugby world cup be? Yeah I'd absolutely love to if I'm still fit and good enough to play for England then 100%. So the next World Cup is in three years in France. So I think the aim is to keep the international setup going and then lead into the World Cup. And in the meantime, do you remain with the Rhinos? Yeah, so I'll be playing with the Rhinos. I'm going to attempt to play a lot more. This season I've struggled getting up and down without a car and trains being like they are. But this coming season I'm going to make quite a big effort to be able to play as much as I can. And then I play union as well, able-bodied union down here as well. Never get time off really. (laughs) It doesn't sound like you do. Do you know it's felt a, a real privilege to talk to you today, Sam? I saw you, some photographs of you, actually on Convex's Instagram and the immediate thought was we've got to get Sam on the podcast. It's really lovely to 
feature one of Convex's own. And that's not why you've been featured. You've been featured because what you've done is inspirational. It's a fantastic achievement. And yeah, I just feel a real sense of pride on your behalf for you and your teammates. What a special moment. Keep it going. And I really hope you get the chance to go to France in three years time and defend your title. That just seems really exciting to me, Sam. Congratulations. Thank you so much. You've been listening to Convex Claims Adjuster Sam Zeller talking about lifting the cup for England in the first World Cup for Physical Disability Rugby League. England defeated New Zealand 42-10 in the final to become the first world champions and Sam's still riding high. Don't forget to download our series at convex.podbean.com or search The Convex Conversation on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple and Google Podcasts or wherever you listen to yours. I'll be back next week, so join me then. And the trophy will be presented in the next few seconds. The first ever winners of the Physical Disability Rugby League World Cup. It's England!